Okay, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. If I were to survey you today, if this morning I were to ask you what you thought the path to joy is, what would be your answer? If this morning I were to ask you what path do you think you need to take in your life that would lead to a joy-filled life? What would you say? Now, here's the thing. Here's what I think many folks think when it comes to how do I have joy? Many folks believe that if they can just get a good job, if they can make lots of money, they can get married, they can have a nice family, yeah, they believe that if they could buy nice things and then one day retire and enjoy all that they had, they would have joy. But you know, that's not what the Bible teaches us. The, the Bible teaches that these things may bring temporary joy, but it's not going to bring a joy that's lasting. But for many, that's their attempt at finding joy. If I could just have somebody new. If I could just have more of what I have. If I can do this, if I can do that, and then they're looking for that path that leads to joy. But you know, the Bible tells us these do not lead to joy. The, the, the things of the world are not the path to joy, but the scripture tells us that the path to joy is through humility. We ask the question, how can humility, how can being humble lead to joy? Well, if you were here last week, well, we've been, this is our third week in, in a teaching series on the habits of joy. And if you remember last week, I, I told you that there were some things that could steal your joy. And some of those things, there are things like pain can steal your joy. People can steal your joy. Pressure can steal your joy. Problems can steal your joy. And in our lives, each of these things, well, today I kind of want to focus on the people aspect. Because I really think people can definitely steal our joy, especially if there's conflict. You know, as we look at, at people and our joy, if, if we're having a conflict with somebody, that will rob our joy in an instant. You ever stop to think what causes conflict? Pride. Hey, every conflict that you ever had, no matter whether it was somebody at work or somebody at home or, or somebody you meet on the street, every conflict, the root of that conflict is going to be pride. So if we think about it, if pride causes an increase in conflict, then the opposite of pride, which is humility, would cause a decrease in conflict. Humility will reduce conflict. Proverbs 13 says, 10 says it this way. Pride always leads to arguments. Pride always. Our pride gets in the way and, and it leads to arguments in our life, no matter where that is. So today we're going to look at chapter 2 in, in our teaching series and the first 11 verses. And as we do, what Paul has given to these believers in Philippi, I think is the greatest lesson on the path to joy. Let me give you the outline real quick. Verses 1 and 2, we see that joy comes through harmony with one another. Verses 3 through 5, harmony comes from humility. And then verses 6 through 11, we see just how Jesus modeled both of those for us. So let, let's read it together. Philippians chapter 2, let's start in verse 1. Philippians 2, 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself with no reputation, and took upon himself, or took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him, 
and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on the earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Look at it. We see this progression through this passage. We see humility leads to harmony. Harmony leads to joy. Verse 2 there gives us four specific aspects of harmony that God says we need in a joyful relationship. Look at that verse. Then fill me with joy by having the same attitude and the same love, living in harmony, and keeping one purpose in mind. Now notice what he says. Fill me with joy by. So, so what Paul is telling them, you want to have joy, you need to have these aspects in your life. Fill me with joy by having the same attitude and the same love, living in harmony, keeping one purpose in mind. So, so he's showing us here, these four together speak of a deep, abiding, eternal unity that Paul's desire, that God's desire, the church of Philippi. The rest of the passage, chapter verse 2, tells us how to achieve it. And how to practice that unity among people. I think one of the biggest things that steal our joy is conflict with other people. It's the way we handle those conflicts. So, so looking at God's word, how we handle those conflicts, do we do it with humility? Or do we put on the boxing gloves? I want to give you, I'm going to call it ways to reduce conflicts with others. But before I do that, I want to give you three warnings this morning. Warning number one. What I'm going to teach you is the exact opposite of what most of you have been taught most of your life. What I'm going to teach you from God's Word is the exact opposite uh, of what you've been taught most of your life. So we need to keep that in mind. Our world tries to tell us how to have relationships. And when we follow the way the world tells us how to have a relationship, how's that working out for you? How it, the world teaches us that it's all about number one. And if everybody just realizes that I'm number one, then we'll have good relationships, right? How's that working? How'd that keep your marriage together? How, how'd that work at the work, at where you work? It does, it does. But what I'm going to teach you from the Bible is the exact opposite of what our world teaches us. Warning number two. What I'm going to teach you will not feel natural. Because our natural instinct is to elevate ourselves. What I'm going to teach you is the exact opposite. It is not going to feel natural. We naturally want to indulge ourselves. So when the Bible teaches us to humble ourselves, it just feels wrong. So, so, so second one, what I'm going to teach you does not feel natural. Now, warning number three. Because I'm going to teach you this this morning. I can almost assure that you will be tested in your relationships with people this week. Because now you know God is going to allow you to be tested in how you handle that conflict. How you handle that relationship with people. So just bear warning. Because we're going to look at God's word. God's going to hold you responsible. He's going to hold you accountable. And you will be tested in this. Maybe not this week, but it'll come. I can promise you. So let, let's jump right in. What do we do? How do we handle these conflicts? Rule number one. Never let pride be my guide. If I'm going to have a joyful relationship with someone else, never let pride be my guide. Pride is the root of, of every other sin. If you think about it, pride is, is no matter what sin you can think about, pride's the root of it. Why does someone steal? Because I want more. Why does someone lie? Because I want to be right. Why does someone, no matter what you put in there, no matter what that sin is, the root of that is pride. No matter what you think of, it's going to be I-centered. So for us to have a joyful relationship, never let pride be our guide. Now, is that what our world teaches us? No, our world teaches us to, re to reward narcissism. Our world teaches us that the, the, the bigger the ego, the more we should offer them. 
I mean, if you think about it, we pay the most money to the athletes with the biggest ego. I mean, it's time to think about it. We do. We reward the most arrogant celebrities. And if you think about it from society's viewpoint, the person with the biggest ego is the one who's going to get the biggest paycheck and the most press. That's what society teaches us. But God says, never let pride be your guide. The Bible teaches us the exact opposite. Well, look again at the first part of verse 3. Here's what it says. Don't act out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Don't act out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Here we find two kinds of pride that leads to conflict. Two things that in our life, these are things that, that they lead to conflict. Number one, selfish ambition. Well, when we look at it, pride that leads to conflict, first thing, selfish ambition. Here's what selfish ambition is. It's all about me. Selfish ambition is when we have the attitude, it's all about me. It's how I look. It's how I dress. It's how I walk. It's how people pay attention to me. It's what I get. When the Bible talks about selfish ambition, it's talking about it's all about me. And, and why we know that. We know that type of person. The one where it's all about me. It's all about my needs. If, if, if it's meeting my needs, then we're good. It's all about my success. It's all about my relationship. It's all about my wants. It's all about my career. I actually know couples that ended, in, uh, the marriage ended in divorce because one determined that the other one was hurting their career. Don't tell me it's not all about me. That they, they ended, or you find this is something else. That they ended, the, the, the marriage ended in divorce because their needs wasn't getting met. It's all about me. That's what society teaches us. That's selfish ambition. Pride that leads to, to conflict is selfish ambition. It's all about me. Or, or I saw this. The idea that I've seen couples break up for, for, for a couple different reasons. Number one reason was I saw one couple who broke up because the other one wasn't popular enough for them. This happens a lot of times in, in young people. Or, or the opposite of that, they got together because they thought it would be good for their reputation to be seen with somebody. You, you, I, so the most important is I take my, my kids to school, and, and uh, used to, you went around behind the school, and as we went around behind the school, I watched this guy and this girl walking down the side, watched them every morning. And every morning, you know, he was like this tall, and she was like this tall. And, and every morning, here he come, he had his arm around her neck. No, there's nothing wrong with that. But the way he had his arm around her neck was kind of in this Neanderthal, now woman type thing. You know, clear up here and, and, and doing around her neck, and well, like he was either going to choke her or drag her, one or the other. And, and every morning, I watched this couple walking down the sidewalk. You know, big old uh, Goliath, a uh, uh, little old meets her, and here they come. And he's like, mm -hmm. you know, woman, school. And, 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 and that's, that's kind of the picture that they gave. Well, it, it happened. I had an opportunity sometime through the year to talk to this young girl. And she was really struggling with the, the relationship that they had. And, he, and here's what she said. She says, sometimes I really think he treats me bad. I gathered that from watching him walk down the sidewalk. So, so I asked her, I said, so why are you with him? You know what her answer was? She didn't even hesitate. He's a football player. <laughs> that was it. That was her reason. So, so what, is, what, what was her center on? Selfish ambition. And, and here's what scripture says. It says there in verse 3, let nothing be done through selfish ambition. If we're going to have joy in our life, it can't be all about me. But you know, there's another aspect of that. Because the verse doesn't just talk about selfish ambition. It talks about vain conceit. Let me back up a second. I got ahead of myself. James 3.16 says this. Where there, wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there is confusion and every kind of evil. You notice what selfish ambition leads to? Confusion. You know why there's confusion at home? Because somebody's got an all about me attitude. You know why things is confusing at work? Because somebody's got an all about me attitude. 
Selfish ambition leads to confusion and every kind of evil. Now let's go to the second one, vain conceit. The other thing, pride leads to conflict, not just selfish ambition, but vain conceit. Here's what vain conceit is. I'm always right. You ever meet somebody like that? They can be as wrong as wrong, but they're always right. And, and, and many times, f- folks look at that one. You know, because what's that about? It's about me. I'm always right. Whatever I say, that's how it has to go. You know, I'm always right. And, and what is it? If I'm always right, what does that make you? Always wrong. Now, how's that going to work in a relationship? You know, if in a relationship I'm always right and you're always wrong, that's not going to work. That's vain conceit. That's part of that pride that, that leads to conflict is when folks are, are filled with that vain conceit. I like the way that today's English version puts the first part of verse 3. Here's what it says. Don't do anything from a cheap desire to boast. Now, now look at that. Don't do anything from a cheap desire to boast. That would be a really good verse to look at before we post on Instagram one day. Or before we go to Facebook. Don't do anything from a cheap desire to boast. You know what that is? That's vain conceit. Do you want to have joy in your relationship? Let me tell you the first thing to do. (coughs) Never let pride be your guide. Number two, be humble or I'll stumble. Scripture teaches be humble or I'll stumble. And I know for some of you, you just thought of a Bible school song. Be (coughs) humble or I'll stumble. Humility is the foundation for every good relationship. Humility is essential for marriage. But let me tell you how dumb I was when I got married. I, I, I thought that marriage was a 50-50 thing. I, I did. I thought that. I thought that marriage was, if I gave 50% and she gave 50%, I, I wasn't good at math, but I knew 50-50, that's 100%, we're going to be good. I thought marriage was a 50-50 thing. You know what marriage is? It's 110 and 110. I have to be, excuse me, I have to be willing to give 110%. She's got to be willing to give 110%. If I'm willing to give 110% no matter what, then it doesn't matter if she didn't give any percent. I'm still giving 110%. That's humility. But often we get that. It's 50-50. I'll tell you, be humble or you'll stumble. Look at the last part of verse 3. The last part says this. Instead, be humble and give more honor to others than yourself. You might want to underline that. Again, be be humble and give more honor to others than yourself. This is the opposite of what culture teaches. Culture teaches us, I've got to do what's best for me. I've got to look out for number one. And isn't that what we learn in society? It's a dog-eat-dog world and I need to be the top dog. That's kind of what we're taught. But the Bible says, be humble. The word humble is probably, I think, the most misunderstood word in the English language. Because here's what I find. I find folks who think that humble means you're going around going, I'm no good. I'm worthless. I don't amount to anything. I can't do anything wrong. And we look at it and we think the humble is, you know what, that's just false humility. That's degrading yourself. That's not humility. But often we think that that, that being humble is putting ourselves so low and thinking so terrible about ourselves. Jesus showed us humility. But you ever see Jesus going, I'm just the most worthless place thing on this earth. Never did he say that. But he showed us humility. So it's not degrading yourself. It's not a false humility. Let me give you the definition of humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. You you may want to keep that. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's not what you think about It's what you think about other people. If you're in here this morning and think, what are these people thinking about me? Do they like
like the way I'm dressed? Do they, do they think my shirt looked good? My collar did? If that was my concern, am I being humble? No, I'm thinking about myself. But if I were to be here this morning and think, what can I do for somebody else here today? That's humble. It's not thinking less about myself. It's thinking about myself less. The, the King James Version says this in the last part of verse 3. Esteem others better than yourselves. I like that. Well, what is humility? Humility is esteeming others better than me. You want to have joy in your relationships? The second way to do it is be humble. Or you will stumble. All right, number three. Learn to pay attention. Learn to pay attention. Do you realize as a society, we have lost the art of paying attention? We don't pay attention anymore. Well, you, you go into society now, where's everybody's attention? <coughs> On a screen. I mean, think about it. Everywhere you go anymore, on a screen. I mean, I've seen folks in church on a screen. And they're going to tell me they're reading their Bible there. You know, you don't read your Bible like this. <laughs> I might have been born in life, but it wasn't last night. But here's the thing. We've lost the art of paying attention because we've got our, our, our face right there. I've been, you go out, go out to eat. Look at how many folks are family sitting around the table together and all of us got their nose and scream. We've been guilty. We've been guilty of doing that. Or, or if it's not a nose and a scream, what they got in the butt did. I was the person one Sunday morning sat in church with their earbuds in. You know, I know it was good preaching, but it didn't desire, deserve this. <laughs> they wasn't listening to the sermon, folks. I truly believe that we've lost so much focus and paying attention that you could go into a public place and scream fire and nobody would notice. I mean, think about it. I, I think it could happen. But look, look at what Paul says in verse 4. Don't be interested only in your own life, but be interested in what concerns others too. Did you get that? Don't be interested just in yourself. He tells us, if we want to have joy, be concerned about others as well. Uh, let, let me let, tell you something that happened to me the other day. Uh, and yesterday, actually. I was at America's favorite shopping place. I didn't say, we don't give commercials here. <laughs> but I was, I was at America's, and it was one of those trips where it was hurry in, hurry out. You know what I'm talking about? I needed uh, jalapenos and... Blood pressure medicine. That, that, that's what I, that was the two things I did. I know that's the combination, but I, I went in after jalapenos and blood pressure medicine. So it was, it was such a quick trip that the, the Holly just stayed in the car. So I go in and, and I go and I get my blood pressure medicine and I go over and I get the biggest bag of the jalapenos that, that, that the bag would hold and I head to the checkout line. And y'all know the checkout line that I don't like to go to. But I looked over at the ones with the desk about this big, and there were six people with carts like this big. So I decided, I can do it myself. So I go over to the do-it-yourself, and I thought I'll do the challenging one first. I'll do the help. I mean, because you got to weigh them and all kinds of stuff. So I put my jalapenos on, and I punched in, and it weighed them, and it told me how I put them in the bag. And I got my, my blood pressure medicine, and no trip to the store is ever right if you don't get something to drink. So I had some drink, and I uh, put a soft drink in there, and, and, and I get ready. I look across, and you know how the, the young lady there that usually helps you if, you, if I couldn't have weighed my jalapeno, she'd help me. And she just kind of had this look on her face. I said, how are you today? Oh, I'm okay. I said, really? I said, busy in here, isn't it? Just small conversation. I didn't, I didn't really say anything to her. I told her, have a nice day. I just thanked her for being there. Never thought anything else about it. Walked out, jalapenos in one hand, blood pressure medicine in had more sugar to go with it. I mean, it did solve the workout. Last evening, I'm looking 
to see if I had any messages. You know, somebody sent me a message on Facebook. And it was one of them where, you know, it wasn't one of my Facebook friends, so I don't accept messages unless I know who it is, so I stalk the profile. I look at the picture. Y'all do too, so you don't look at me like that. I looked at the picture, and, and guess what I saw? I saw a little cashier girl from Walmart. I thought, well, she's not that bad, so I played. I heard she wasn't like a murderer or something. <laughs> you know what she gave me? She said, I found you on Facebook. I just want to thank you for being nice to me today. Aww. You were about the only one. Aww. You know what? Sometimes we got to quit being so interested in yourself. I don't like the self-checkout. I, and everybody in the world knows that. <laughs> but you don't want that little girl meeting somebody to tell her happy. Well, what, what, what do we need to do in life? I said, we need to learn to pay attention. You want to have joy in your life? Let's get out of our eye focus. Well, let's start paying attention to other people. And what did it take me? Less than 10 seconds. Made some little girl's day. Let's learn to pay attention. Number four. Ask, what would Jesus do? Now, I know, we, we've used that phrase till we've made t-shirts, we've made bracelets, we've made headbands, we've put it on soccer balls. But what would Jesus do? To, to the point where it almost seems trite to ask that question. But, but here's the thing. If we're going to have joy in our relationships, we have to constantly ask that question over and over. What would Jesus do? When I'm at the ball field, what would Jesus do? Ooh, I shouldn't have went there. If I'm dry, if I'm at home with my family, what would Jesus do here? If I'm driving down the road and somebody cuts me off, what would Jesus do? See, and now, uh, you're, you're relating, aren't you? Here's the thing. We have to constantly ask that question. If we're going to have joy in our relationships with others, we have to always ask that question, what would Jesus do? Because our attitude has to be the same as Jesus' attitude. I mean, if you think of it, look at what it says in verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. So we have to constantly ask that question, what would Jesus do? Now we say, what does it mean to have the attitude of Christ Jesus? You know, what does that mean? The next verse just shows us three things. The first one I see in verse 6 is I don't demand what I think I deserve. I don't demand what I think I deserve. Verse 6 says this. Although he was in the form of God and equal to God, he did not take advantage of this equality. But look at that. Although he was God, Jesus didn't demand that he be treated as God. What did he do? He humbled himself. In our society, I told you it's the opposite of what we're taught. Because in our society, we're taught we have rights. We have rights and I demand my rights be met. But isn't that what we hear all the time? I have rights. Let, let me give you an example. This, this was a couple years back, because I don't do this anymore. But I went through the drive-thru, and I ordered a large sweet tea. Paid my dollar and six cents, got my sweet tea, came to the office. Ready to start my day, open up my straw, put it in the cup. What did I order? A large sweet tea. I put the straw in the cup. It only took a half a sweet, sweet, sweet. It was the devil's brew. <laughs> there was no sugar in that cup whatsoever. Let me ask you a question. What would you do in that situation? Take it back. 
think of that. What would you do? Now let's ask, because here are my options. I could get back in my car, and I could drive 9.6 miles round trip to go up and tell them there's no sugar in this cup. That was option number one. Option number two, I could go on social media and I could let the world know that I got the devil's broom in my cup. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. You notice I didn't tell you there was a third option. I wasn't about to drink it. Let me ask you, I asked you what you would do. I asked you a question. What would Jesus do? Was it, what did I order? Large sweet tea. What did I get? <laughs> I paid for a large sweet tea. Did I deserve to have a large sweet tea? Was it my right to have a large sweet tea? So, should I demand my right? Yeah. What would Jesus do? See, that's why we have to cross it. Because here's the thing. We're not trying always in the big stuff. We're going to be tested in the little things sometimes. And we have to ask that question for our attitude. Do, are we going to demand what we think we deserve? Because if so, we're never going to have joy. But, but I think often we think, why is there it's my right. What does it mean to have the attitude of Christ? I don't demand what I think I deserve. Number two, I look for ways I can serve. Very simple. I look for ways I can serve. Look at verse 7. Instead, he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, by becoming like other humans. Society teaches us that the more people we have serving us, the more important we are. But the Bible teaches us the more people we serve, the more important we are. You ever realize how often you're tested on that as well? How often you're tested on serving people in ways that nobody would notice. You ever be walking along somewhere and you look down and there's trash? What do you do about it? Well, they pay somebody to pick that up. I'm not touching that. I don't know where that's been. What do we do? Or do we just pick it up and throw it away? Or when you go to your favorite shopping place, and it's raining, and you rush to the car and you unload your stuff, what do you do with it? Now, is anybody ever going to chase you through the parking lot because you just parked it next to the car next to you and pretended like it wasn't yours? No. They're going to tell you, you didn't return your buggy, so you can't come back here and shop. Heavens, no, they like the money. But you have to ask yourself a question. What would Jesus do? Am I looking for ways that I can serve and folks, we're being tested at that, just in little things. Each and every day. What do we do? How do we serve? Even though we're not going to get recognition, you know, they're not going to put my picture up with a buggy rack and say, this man returned his buggy three times in a row. <laughs> but we're being tested in our service. All right, number three. I do what is right even when it's painful. You want to have the attitude of Christ. I do what is right, even when it's painful. Look at verse 8. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Death on a cross. Even though it was painful, Jesus did. And you know, folks, sometimes doing this right hurts. But you want to experience joy in your relationship. We do what's right, even if it hurts. 
think one of the things that steals our joy, probably more than anything else, or as much as anything else at least, is conflict with people. It's just conflict in our relationships. And, and, and I'm going to guess we all can tell stories of conflict in our relationships. But I want to have joy. I want to I wanna, I wanna experience joy. So how do I do it? How do you do it? Number one, never let pride be your guide. Maybe this morning, you need to ask God to reveal to you the pride in your life so that you can turn from it. Be humble, or you will stumble. Is it? It's all about me. I'm always right. Or I'm humble. Be humble, or you stumble. Maybe, maybe today you, you you've been struggling. You know why there's no lasting joy? Maybe it's because of your humility. Maybe today for you it's learning to pay attention. Maybe you are that person with your face in the screen, the earbuds in all the time. Maybe it's time just to put others first. Pay attention to the needs of others. Or maybe today it's beginning that habit of your life to always ask, what would Jesus do? You know what? I'm almost going to guess that there's folks here this morning that God's already brought to mind times when you didn't ask, what would Jesus do? And this morning he wants you to confess that sin so that it's not dividing you him. In a moment, we're going to sing a final hymn, and as we do, it's your time to confess your sin to God. Or maybe you're here this morning, and you find that most of your life has been about that great big eye. It's all about me. Maybe today you need to say, God, I want it to be all about Jesus. Repent of your sin and turn to Him. Maybe today your life has been so much about you that you've been trying to to save yourself. But you realize you can't do that. You need the blood of Jesus to save your soul. And it's time to surrender to him. But today let that be your prayer. But folks, we want to have joy in our relationships. We've got to develop habits to do away with the conflict. So I don't know what God spoke to you today, but maybe he has. So as we sing this final hymn, maybe right where you're at, you just want to take a moment and pray. Maybe you want to come near this altar. Let, let this be your altar of prayer. Maybe this morning you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Or maybe some way you need to be obedient to him that you need to let folks know about. I'm going to invite you to come. I'll join you right down there. I'll pray with you. And we'll rejoice over what he's doing in your life. But whatever God wants to do, say yes. So that you can be on that road to joy, habits of joy. Father God, thank you for your word. Oh Lord, thank you so much for all you do in our lives. Lord, we want to have joy. But so often it seems that other people stay in the way. Help us, Lord, to have the mind of Christ, the attitude of Christ, and be like him so we can have joy in our relationships. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.